I do. Another person would be Dr. Um, Rangacheri. Dr. Seti Rangacheri, he's very famous. He's written multiple textbook, textbooks that have been sold worldwide. Um, actually, his textbook on um, the anatomical atlas of neurosurgery it has been like the best seller through the AANS. That's the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. Um, he also has a wide knowledge base and likes to ask lots of questions, but he's very, very nice to all the students and um, he likes to guide uh, students as well. Um, does anybody have any questions that specifically I can try to answer maybe? Um, go ahead. Yes. When I'm hungry, I shake. But you know, then everybody sees that. But um, in general, you need to have a steady hand. Um, I've heard of people who like say, oh, we're going to test you before you get into neurosurgery. That's really not true. No one really looks at that. I know some staff that actually shake a little bit, and that's fine. In the OR, your hands are not up in the air, so you're not operating like this kind of thing. So when you're operating, usually your hands are resting on something. So they really don't shake unless you have a very bad tremor. And in that case, you might be a candidate for some neurosurgical procedure. Um, so, so shaking is really not, uh, you, you, I, I don't think that, you know, even if you drink coffee, some people shake. I think that's okay. That's an essential tremor. That's fine. Um, any other questions? Um, here it's seven years. Uh, the majority today, um, and I think that more and more, most programs are leaning towards seven years. There's a few left that are still six-year programs. Um, our program used to be an eight-year program with the PhD. So it was two years of PhD, um, basically two years of research, and you were expected to get a PhD during those two years. Right now, it's one year of research, and you don't get a PhD, but it's optional. So if you would desire to get a PhD, you can if you wanted to. I know a lot of people really are not interested in PhDs unless they're interested in academia. Are you still involved in research now, or do you not have time for it? Um, no, I'm, I am still involved in, in research. I do a lot of research. I like writing. And um, so it's, it's hard when you're a resident to um, do all those things. But if you kind of put your time on how you want to do it, and you have good support from the staff, you can separate some time to do research as well. It's not, I don't have dedicated time, but the people where I worked in the lab, they're always, they have been very helpful with like continuing my research projects. And, um, Yeah, so that, that's that's cool. Um, we we have clinics. Um, we're expected to attend clinic usually during your first and your second year of neurosurgery. Um, the first year you have spine clinic. The second year you have skull base clinic, and that's with uh, Dr. Morali Guthikanda. Um, other than that, you see all your patients preoperatively and postoperatively on the floor, meaning like either in the ICU or you will see them on our neurosurgical unit. Uh, after the, the surgery is completed, after they are discharged from the hospital, usually it falls on someone who's maybe like in their first or second year to see them again in the clinic. So usually the, the higher you are on the hierarchy, so you really don't see your patients as often as you probably should. And, um, but we, we try to cover clinic once in a while. So sometimes we will go over if they need help and we'll cover clinic. But it's not a scheduled clinic. I kind of want to know what it was like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for your family, your wife, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah. 
Uh, let's see. So where should I start? Um, I, you know, so it's hard. It's hard. Um, I, I, am, I feel that I have always looked a little bit more at my career than perhaps I should have at my family. And my wife is always there to kind of correct me on that. But um, I, I have a daughter at home. She's eight months old, and I'm in residency. And uh, what can I say? We, we have achieved a lot together. And I think it's hard. And if I ask you, you should probably have someone who's very supportive. My wife is also in the medical field, and so she understands. But someone who's not in the medical field might not comprehend as much what a doctor actually does, and so there might be difficulty there. Um, the divorce rate among neurosurgeons is very high. So. We're working on <laughs> <laughs> There you go. Yeah. After your residency, mm -hmm. is the time commitment still really high? Um, it depends how much money you want to make basically, is what it boils down to. And it depends also on the practice that you join. So if you join a, l a large, that's okay. If, if you join a large practice, so um, usually your call schedule will be less. But if you have a, a practice that involves maybe two or three neurosurgeons, so usually you might be on call every third night. Usually what the I have noticed is what most neurosurgeons will try to take a week of call, okay, and then be off call. So if there's three people, then they'll be off call for two weeks. But that means that usually they try to operate as much as they can during those two weeks. That week that they were on call, they really didn't operate as much. And so their time there is, again, occupied, at least during the daytime, or in clinics and things like that. Um, usually we see a, a typical example. I have a, a very good friend who's a neurologist. And so I went over to his office to kind of just watch him you know, with his patients. And uh, in the morning, he just saw like three patients. And, and, and I was flabbergasted. I said, you know, I see like 20 patients in the morning, you know, from 8 to 10, 8, 8 to 12, 8 to 11, you know, I see a lot of patients. And it's interesting. So he said to me, it's because we can bill for our examination. So the more thorough an exam that they have, that's kind of like us operating. That's what they bill for. And so, you know, it, it, it depends what you want to do. So, again, in neurosurgery, you can do the same thing. You can do an extensive examination. You can bill for your extensive examination. But then how many patients of those will be operative? See? So it's pros and cons. And so you have to take into account everything that you want. Um, I prefer to see a lot of patients. But then, of course, it's, it's in, in, in the future, you will see that it's dangerous as well, because the more patients that you see, or the higher the volume, the more of the risk you will have for getting sued as well. So that's also something that you have to take into account. But I think if you're nice to people, you, you know, if you follow common ethical standards, you won't be sued. Um, it's. I think it's pretty straightforward in, in terms of that. I, I know several residents, actually, that have been sued as well. And so, it, you know, when you're involved in a suit, it's usually they, they look for everybody. But um, yeah? What kind of solidified your decision? The challenge. Um, I need a challenge in life. Otherwise, I'm not satisfied. Uh, if you go, for example, Someone who does PM&R, and, and I'm, not, I'm not downplaying anyone here or any of the other specialties. If you do internal medicine, um, you, you, you round a, a large part of the day. So you see 15 patients. Well, our list has 20, 30 patients on it sometimes. And we see them in about one hour. And we get accomplished. The exact same thing that was done here is done here. But it's focused, it's high concentration, and you want to make sure 
that all of your patients are taken care of the same way.